Uh, well, good morning. My name is Janet Knodel. I'm the professor and extension entomologist at NDSU. And we'll give a quick rundown here on the insect pest of soybean and some insecticide updates. First, I'm going to talk about the new pest of soybean, uh, soybean gall midge. <clears throat> it's in the family Cediomyidae, which is a gall midge or gall gnat. Uh, many of you are familiar with wheat midge, and that's also in this family. As you can see in the picture over on the top right, uh, the fly is very small. It's only about an eighth of an inch, has mottled wings and black and white striped legs. And you're most not likely to see it out in the field. They're very short lived. Uh, so you're more likely to see the larvae that I'll show you in a, a bit here. Uh, for the host that we know of, uh, soybean is probably the preferred host. It has been observed in sweet clover and alfalfa, but it's very uncommon in those two hosts. And in 2022, our University of Minnesota documented a new host, unfortunately, uh, dry beans and lima beans. And right before this uh, presentation, I just got some information from the University of Minnesota on some of their evaluations. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can see uh, here's the soybeans that are much more preferred over, you know, the dry beans here. Uh, this is black, uh, red, great northern. And then it also gets into lima bean in your gardens. And that one was probably the most preferred out of the dry beans. So um, it will looks, you know, looks like it will get into dry beans, but soybeans again is the preferred host. And here you can see this is in uh, the <clears throat> dry beans. It seems to get down into the lower part of the stem. And here you can see the orange colored larvae. So they have uh, two generations per year for the life cycle. If we start with the overwintering larval cocoon in the soil, uh, they will go through a pupal stage, a short pupal stage next year as the temperatures start to warm up in the spring. And then the adult will emerge. And as I mentioned, it only lives three to five days. Uh, so unless you're emergence trapping with uh, cages for research, you probably won't see the adult. Um, in Minnesota, it usually emerges mid to late June. And then the mate and the female will lay eggs and wounds or openings along the stem of the soybean. Eggs are very small, you need magnification to see them inside the cracks and wounds. And then the larvae will hatch from the eggs and they go through three different growth stages, we call them instars. When they first hatch, they're white in color and then they kind of change to an orange, reddish orange and they do the damage to the soybean plant. They feed on it, extracting the nutrients and water. And they feed for about two to three weeks. And then if this is the last uh, generation that we're gonna have, say it's getting close to fall, they'll drop off the plant and then pupate um, as a pre-pupa uh, in the soil. So when you're out in the field, it's keep your eyes open for any of the symptoms of soybean gall midge infested plants. Uh, you can see wilting here. You might see a darkening at the base of the stem. If you were to pull that plant up and then remove the outer epidermis, 
you may see the brightly colored orange larvae underneath the uh, epidermis. And or you may see a lesion, you may think it's a disease, or in a severe situation, it could be a dead plant. Here's just a close up. Again, you can see the younger larvae, the white, you know, versus the older, more mature larvae uh, that are getting closer to dropping off of the plant. They do cause yield impacts, unfortunately, most commonly on the field edges. The reason why it's highest on the field edges is the adult midge is a weak flyer and they're emerging from last year's soybean fields. They move over into the newly seeded spring soybeans that are starting to emerge. And sometimes with our corn soybean rotations, that's just across the road. Um, so they infest the field edges first. And this reduces plant stand and number of seeds per pods. Yield loss can vary. Uh, this is from yield loss here up to 50 feet into the field is zero. But as you walked into the field further, 400 uh, feet, uh, you can see the yield went up. However, it's still below the average of 50 bushels per acre. And that was down in Nebraska where the population is quite severe. Uh, current distribution is five states, maybe six, um, in 150 counties. You can see here each year, they're all color coded here. And they continue to expand in its distribution and it's found um, in more counties. And there is a regional multi-state survey that's going on in 12 Midwestern states that North Dakota is participating in. And most of the states you see here in this picture are the ones that are involved in the survey. It goes way out to Ohio, south to Missouri and Kansas. So this is uh, from the survey work that we did. This is what we found last year. All the black spots are negative or no soybean gall midge. Unfortunately, in Sargent County, we have one that we tentatively confirmed. We're still awaiting the DNA results. They keep rerunning them with the larvae that we collected from the field. Um, but some of the earlier runs had a 92% match to soybean gall midge genetics. So I'm convinced that it is a soybean gall midge larvae because it was a very bright red orange uh, larvae that we found out in the field. So what to do if you do see this, um, you know, certainly it's probably going to continue to expand um, in North Dakota, just like the other states. So if you do see a lesion and you open that up with a small knife or your fingernail and you see these small orange whitish uh, larvae, uh, please uh, collect them. You can use rubbing alcohol or ethanol and put them into a, a vial. Any glass jar that you have, you know, label it with the county date, GPS coordinates, and your contact information. And then contact your local county extension agent or myself. Uh, we'll probably come out and inspect the field. And then we need to determine, you know, which species of gall midge it is by DNA testing. There is another gall midge in North Dakota, the white mold gall midge, Carciomaya colicola. Uh, this one does not do any harm to the soybean. Um, it feeds on the fungus white mold, sclerotinia. 
So again, you can see the adults very small, about an eighth of an inch again, no modeling in the wings and no black and white striping on the legs. So it looks very different. And it's been recorded in any crop that gets white mold, soybean, dry bean, canola, potatoes, and sunflowers in North Dakota. And it's fairly widespread in those crops. And here you can see a close up of the mycelia from the white mold fungus and the larvae that are feeding on it. It's usually not as bright red orange. It's more of a duller orange, but no economic damage to the soybeans. Probably doing it a little bit of a favor, but, <laughs> but we can see how easy it is to confuse this with the soybean gall edge larvae. So get a hold of this publication. Uh, it's available online, or you can order a hard copy through your county agent. And this says, goes into more detail on how to you know, identify them. But we do need to see all the samples right now um, to make sure and confirm through DNA techniques that it's soybean gallmage or white mold gallmage. And we did run the Sargent County sample near Gwinner for DNA uh, typing for white mold gallmage, and it came up 0% match. <laughs> so we know for sure that it's not white mold gallmage. And here's just another picture showing you the difference between the larvae and kind of the color. Um, you're always going to see that white mold with this particular species. Another insect I like you to watch for is bean leaf beetle. We're seeing increasing populations the last several years and they overwinter as adults and they have two different color phases. There's a red and then there's a more green and they can have the four spots and line along the side of the wing covers or not, like over here. But they always have this triangle here in the middle. So you can use that for identification. They have two to three generations per year, uh, depending on how, how warm it is. Uh, larvae, you're probably not gonna see. Uh, they are in the soil and they feed on secondary roots and hairs. Um, <clears throat> we do monitor for this through the NDSU IPM program, and you can see most of the population that is really increasing is over in the southeast corner where most of the soybeans are grown. And here again, and we picked it up fairly readily. In general, it wasn't economic yet, uh, but we are seeing it more. We hardly you know, 10 years ago, we hardly saw a bean leaf beetle. And this is probably our most furthest west detection, which surprised me way out in Grant County. So the adult causes most of the damage uh, by chewing on the leaves and they create these nice little round circular holes between the veins and the first generation that comes out early in the spring is controlled by insecticide seed treatments that are registered in soybean. For defoliation or the economic threshold to determine if you do need to treat, uh, we use uh, defoliation, percent defoliation, 30% in the vegetative stage, 20% uh, in the R1 bloom, to early seed are five, and then 10% in full seed. And of course, if they do any pod feeding or clipping, you know, that would indicate you need to be a little proactive to prevent any um, feeding directly on the pods. They can also vector viruses. So we did an insecticide trial since we had a, some fields near Fargo that had quite a large number of bean leaf beetle. And we tested uh, 
all of these premixes here. Premixes are insecticides that have two active ingredients. Uh, some of these you may not recognize, um, certainly Hero, but Renestra, some of these are quite new uh, to soybeans. Indigo ZC from Syngenta, Ridgeback from Corteva, and our standard Warrior II from Syngenta. Uh, and this shows you what mode of action uh, they're in. Most of them are, you know, have a premix of uh, pyrethroid. Uh, for example, um, 90 here is the uh, uh, pyropenes, which um, are probably not effective on bean leaf beetle, but we have this pyrethroid here that'll probably provide some knockdown. And here's the rates we tested. Uh, now, some of them are high, some of them are medium rates. This is 10.3 fluid ounces per acre. So that's the highest rate of HERO, uh, $22, uh, which usually we don't use that high of a rate, but this is uh, <clears throat> what the company wanted. So you can see the cost can vary depending on the insecticide and the rate. So we got um, here on the axes here, we got bean leaf beetle adults per square meter, and we didn't have economic populations. So here's the uh, pre-spray in blue. You can see we had equal numbers of bean leaf beetles across all the treatments. And we did accounts at five and 10 days after treatment, five orange, 10 gray, you can see we had significantly lower bean leaf beetles in all of our plots. And just a friendly reminder to, to always scout for soybean aphid. Um, you know, look on the underside of those leaves. Uh, watch the video if you need a refresher. And we are seeing the last two years a slight increase. Late August, uh, the aphids have been coming in especially over in the river valley, but generally uh, not economic at the threshold yet. But watch for them. We have pyrethroid re resistance that's widespread and it's cross resistance, meaning if, if it's cross resistance, meaning it won't, and none of them will work. So it's resistant to bifenthrin, it's resistance to warrior, um, all of those. So use these newer insecticides here in the red box at the bottom. Uh, Transform WG, Savanto Prime, and Safina. And they're not more expensive than your pyrethroids. So uh, use these newer insecticides when you need to control your soybean aphids. Scout regularly, use your thresholds and rotate modes of action when you got to spray more than once. And here's your fact sheet if you want more information on the resistance management. We got to start being proactive. And drought is still here. We're still in abnormally dry to severe drought, believe it or not. <laughs> But the long-term drought monitor um, indicates, uh, you know, very few areas of drought and the more green blue areas indicate more rain. So in spite of that, we're still probably going to see grasshoppers again. So be sure you scout for grasshoppers. Uh, they often move into the field edges first when they're in the nymph stage. And uh, you know, be proactive if they're at the threshold. And here you can see uh, last year, most of the grasshoppers were higher out west uh, than the eastern part of the state. So we did have some hot spots. There, and I want you to be aware of a new insecticide, Vanticore, uh, group 28, diamine. Um, it's registered in soybean and also for your cutworms. And grasshoppers, uh, for grasshoppers, use the MSO edge event at 1%. Target the early instars, but we did an insecticide trial with adult grasshoppers, uh, Vanticore at three different rates, low, medium, 
and high. And you can see here's our standard warrior and it was comparable. So it worked very good. It's a little bit slower acting because it's a muscle poison. Um, so it takes a little bit longer to kill the insect. So I want you to try some of these newer um, insecticides. Uh, Vanticor at the low rate is about $10 per acre. Uh, and try to move away from always using pyrethroids because uh, we're starting to see an increase in insecticide resistance, especially with the pyrethroids. And with that, I'll either answer questions now or later.